The World Tomorrow. The Worldwide Church of God presents Herbert W. Armstrong, bringing you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Herbert W. Armstrong. Today, we're living in the most frightening, the most terrifying, the most momentous days of the history of this whole earth. Never before has any previous generation lived in times like these. Never has there been a time of world eruption, of world trouble, of world chaos, such as we're living in today. And there is no peace, and there is no hope of peace. And the future outlook is dark indeed, if it were not for the good news of the world tomorrow. But in the meantime, mankind is bringing himself to total oblivion. If God Almighty didn't intervene, there would no flesh be saved alive on this earth. So said Jesus Christ 1900 years ago. So say your world-famous scientists today. And that's official. Now, we've been seeing in this most neglected and one of the most wonderful books in all the Bible, the book of Hebrews, which is the priesthood book, we've been seeing how Jesus Christ is on the job today and has been for 1900 years and more, night and day, on the job. As I've said before in this series, you've heard a lot about Christ's ministry of three and a half years, over 1900 years ago. We talk a lot about that. You've heard a lot about Christ hanging on a cross dead. You see pictures of him hanging on a cross dead. You hear a little about once a year about the resurrection of Christ on Easter time, because Easter is supposed to celebrate the resurrection. Actually, it doesn't, believe it or not. Startling as that may be, if you don't believe that, write for our booklet on Easter, and it'll certainly startle you. It will shock you, but it's factual, and it's absolutely truth, and you can prove it. Very few people, however, ever give a thought to what has Jesus Christ been doing since? And so we've been looking in this priesthood book. He's on the job for you and me. And if you don't know what he's doing, and if you don't realize the connection between his work, his job now, and you, well, I wouldn't give you very much for your chances of the salvation that a lot of you think you have. And a great many people are deceived and don't have what they think they have today. It's about time we begin to wake up and get our eyes open to the truth. Now, here we've been in this third chapter, and we've come to the place where Paul, the Apostle Paul, in writing this for us, had quoted from one of the Psalms. He had quoted from the Psalm 95, verses 7 to 11, where David in David's day had written, Today, if you, that's those in David's day, will hear his voice. Now, that was hundreds of years after Moses. So he said to them in that time, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of the temptation in the wilderness, as they did back in Moses' time. At the time they were being led by Moses out of Egypt and on over to the promised land. That, my friends, was the picture, the type, of our being led out of the slavery of sin, which is the transgression of God's law, in other words, going to ways that have seemed right to man, and contrary to the ways of God, and being led out of The slavery that that has imposed, in other words, the way that seemed right to a man, has only brought curses upon us, and it's bringing final death. And so, their being delivered out of Egypt was a type of our being delivered out of sin. And their journey through the wilderness on to the promised land was the type of our journey through this life. And the promised land, the Palestine that they were to enter into then, was the type of our entering into the kingdom of God and the final rest from all of the curses that we've brought on ourselves by defying God and the way of God. And so David was saying to those people, harden not your hearts, as they had done back there, when he said, Your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. And so God said, He swore in His wrath, They shall not enter into my rest. And that generation did not. Every one except two of that generation died, never got into Palestine. Now then, the warning of David was that if they did not continue to obey God, if they continued in unbelief and in disobedience, they would never enter into any final rest from all of these troubles of this life and the curses that we bring on ourselves. Now, at the very last of the chapter, I want to go back and pick up something here that I want you to get. 
and to whom did he swear that they should never enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient back in the days of Moses. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Unbelief that was shown in their disobedience. Now then, I want to show you again, my friends, because the next verse here, verse 12, to us says, Take heed, brethren. Now he's speaking, of course, to those that are already Christians. Brethren are those that have been begotten of God, that have received the Holy Spirit of God, the ones that are already brethren, not to the people in the world. This is not an evangelistic appeal to get converted. This is a message to those who are converted. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you, that is, already converted Christians, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, how did they depart from God? That is used as a type for the way we can depart from God. We've gone back into the 16th chapter of Exodus, and here we found that the Eternal had said unto Moses before the Old Covenant was given, before any of the law of Moses was given, before the old covenant had been made with Israel, he said, when they were grumbling because they had nothing to eat and they were hungry, and God said, well, I'll perform a miracle. I'll rain bread from heaven for you, and you shall go out, the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. Now it shall come to pass, God said, on the sixth day, that they shall prepare that that they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. There would be enough each day for that day. God only gave them today's bread today, but on the sixth day he gave them the bread for two days, twice as much. Well, then on the sixth day, Moses said, now this is what the Lord had said. He said that they went out and gathered twice as much each man. There was twice as much falling from heaven on that day. And he said, This is that which the Eternal hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Eternal. So bake that that you'll bake today, and boil that that you'll boil, and whatever remains, keep it over until tomorrow. Do your baking, your boiling, and all the preparation today. Today's a preparation. Tomorrow is a holy Sabbath. So they laid it up until the morning, and it did not breed worms and stink, whereas every other day it had. And here God was revealing whether time had been lost. If you have any doubt about time having been lost, and maybe we don't know which day God rested on at creation, write for our booklet, Has Time Been Lost? That will give you seven lines of positive proof as to whether or not time has gotten mixed up. Have we got the calendar mixed up? Do we know which day is the same seventh day God rested on at creation? Well, he was revealing to the Israelites there. Now, on that day it didn't breed worms and stink, and every other day it did. And then Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the eternal. Today you shall not find it in the field. Well, some of them thought it didn't make any difference. Some of them thought time might have gotten mixed up. So they went out on this day together, and they said, Well, we'll wait until the next day, the first day of the week, and we'll rest on that day. We'll make that our rest day. And so it came to pass, there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, but they found none. And the eternal said to Moses, how long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? Here were God's commandments, here were God's laws, before the old covenant, before the law of Moses had been given. This is no part of the law of Moses. They didn't know there ever would be such a thing as the law of Moses. In fact, there wasn't any such thing. It had never been given. But God was saying, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? And here was one of them that antedates the Old Covenant. Now, the Old Covenant then couldn't take it away. The Old Covenant didn't bring it. It couldn't take it away. Here was a law of God, my friends, that the law of Moses didn't bring and the law of Moses can't take away. The Eternal said, How long refuse you to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Eternal hath given you the Sabbath. He didn't say Moses gave it to you. He said the Eternal has given it to you. Now, listen, my friends. Most of you have always heard that Moses gave it to them. You know you have. Open your Bible, Exodus 16, verse 29, and see it. See, for the Eternal hath given you the Sabbath, not Moses. Therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days, abide ye every man in his place, let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. And so the people rested on the seventh day after that stern rebuke. Now then, next I wanted you to turn over here to Exodus 32 now, and the first four verses. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain. Now, this is after the Old Covenant had been made, and Moses is up getting some of the laws from God on the mount. He was up there 40 days and 40 nights. 
And what did the people do while Moses was away from them forty days? Just let God send a leader. People will follow the leader. They want to follow a man instead of following God. And they'll follow the man, and if a man is a man of God, they're following God because they follow the man. But just let that man go away about forty days, and the people forget all about him. And they get back into their own ways again. My friends, most of you are like that. That's human nature. And my friends, listen, that's the thing you were put on this earth to overcome. That's the thing you were put here to eradicate out of your nature. Why don't you begin to really follow God? Now, Moses delayed to come down. Yes, God kept him up there for forty days. Then the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods. Make some idol gods, in other words. Make us gods which shall go before us. And as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. You know, my friends, in my personal experience, I have learned that's exactly the way people will act. I've had a little flock that had been raised up. People have been brought to God, which God had brought to him through my efforts. I hadn't done it. God had done it, but he had used me. But the people looked to me. And as soon as the work began to expand and I was taken to Hollywood and New York and Chicago and different places in order to get the work of God going on radio stations coast to coast and all over the nation, I only needed to be gone about 40 days, and the people say, oh, as for this Herbert W. Armstrong, we want not what's become of him. Let's go off into some other doctrines, and let's get off into others. Let's throw away this truth. I have seen it happen. What kind of human beings are we, anyhow? And I found they'd only been looking to a man in the first place. My friends, I'm not trying to get you to look at me. I'm trying to get you to look at Jesus Christ. He's your Savior. He's on the throne of grace, and he's there night and day. And you can go direct to him any time. Don't you know that? He is there. I'm merely a, just another human being to sort of help you a little, that's all. But God is the one that does it. I haven't any power. I just have a little faith, and God has given me faith, and I know he hears. Well, anyway, let's go on with this real rapidly now. In the seventh verse, this is in Exodus 32. And the Eternal said to Moses, Go get thee down, for thy people have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way. Now, I want you to notice what they did. They had turned quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and worshipped it. Now, what was it we read back here in Hebrews? David had written of these people, They do always err in their heart, as God had said. He was grieved of that generation. They do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. Now, in what general manner did they turn away from God? There were two things above all other things that they turned to their own way and away from God's ways, and that was in breaking the Sabbath and in worshiping idols. Here they had made an idol, and God said, They have not known my ways. They have quickly gotten out of the way which I commanded them. God has commanded us away, and that's why you're put on this earth, is to learn that way and live it. Now, next, I want to read Leviticus 26 here. Here was what God had said through Moses in the day of Moses to those people. He said to them, You shall make no idols nor graven image to bow down unto it. I am the Eternal your God. Then he said, You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Eternal. Just those two commandments he stressed. Why? Because those were the two that they seemed to disobey more than any other. Now, listen, it doesn't make any difference, my friends, which commands you break. If you break any one, you're guilty of all. You're guilty if you break any one of them. Because it's like... And there are the ten general principles, the ten general uh, broad principles of the Ten Commandments, and all the law hangs on that, and it's all on the one word love, and on the two great commandments, love to God and love to neighbor, and the first four commandments tell you how to love God, and the last six, how to love your neighbor, and all the Bible is merely an elaboration and magnification of that. The whole way of God is summed up in those ten spiritual principles, not moral code, but spiritual principles of life. It is the way of God. God. Now, it's like the ten links of a chain, and if you break any one link, you've broken the chain. But these are the two that Israel was continually breaking. These are the two, then, that God stressed. And he said, 
If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then will I give you rain in due season. The land shall yield its increase. You'll have crops the year around, and I'll give you peace in the land, and five of you can chase a hundred, and a hundred of you can put ten thousand to flight. They would have become the greatest, mightiest, most powerful nation on the face of the earth. If they would keep his commandments. But, he said, if you will not hearken unto me to do all of these commandments, I'll even appoint over you tower, consumption, the burning ague, or fever, that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain. Your enemies shall eat it. You shall be slain before your enemies, and they that hate you shall reign over you. And it was a 2,520-year punishment that God pronounced on them. If they didn't keep his commandments, he mentioned, too, idolatry and Sabbath-breaking as the two sins that they were to avoid. Now, they were divided into two nations, and first Israel and then Judah broke both the Sabbath and the command against idolatry. Those were the two commandments, my friends, for which they were driven into the greatest punishment that God Almighty has ever meted out to any race or any people, his own chosen people, because of those two great commandments. That's the way they didn't walk in his ways. That's the way they didn't have faith in God. That's the way they departed from him. Now, here in the 20th chapter of Ezekiel, God says, beginning verse 10, speaking of the house of Israel now, Wherefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt, and I brought them into the wilderness, and I gave them my statutes, and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Moreover also, now in addition to that, I gave them my Sabbaths, to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Eternal that does sanctify them. He gave them the Sabbath as a sign by which they would know who the true God is and be kept in the true worship of the true God. And the God that sanctifies or sets them apart as his people that would, in other words, identify them to the world as the people of God. It was the identifying sign that identified God so they would know who God was. It identified them as his people. So he gave them this particular badge of identification as the very sign of God for that purpose. But what happened? But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbaths, not the Jews' Sabbaths, these were not Jews, these were Israelites. And they were never Jews, never called Jews. The first place the word Jews in your Bible is mentioned, Second Kings 16, verse 6. Read it after the broadcast is over. Second Kings 16, 6. And there you find these Israelites, Israel at war against the Jews, and the Jews against Israel, a different nation altogether. The Jews were merely those of Judah that split off and seceded and formed a new nation, the kingdom of Judah. Now, and my Sabbaths they greatly polluted, not the Jewish Sabbath, God says, my Sabbath. And then I said, I would pour out my fury unto them in the wilderness to consume them. But, he said, I wrought for my name's sake, it should not be polluted before the heathen in whose sight I brought them out. But he talked to their children a generation later. Verse 18, I said to their children in the wilderness, Walk not in the statutes of your fathers, neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Eternal, your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, and do them, and hallow my Sabbaths. My friends, can you see that their fathers that had walked in the ways of the Gentiles around them had kept a different Sabbath. And God says, don't hallow their ways, don't hallow their Sabbaths, but hallow my Sabbaths. There's a great difference. I want to tell you, my friends, this thing is more important with God than you even remotely dream of. Now, a carnal-minded man will say, well, I can't see where it makes any difference. Well, neither did those people back there in the wilderness. They didn't know God's ways, the ways of God they had not known. And you were born without knowing the ways of God, and if you haven't been taught the ways of God, you don't know them, my friends. It's about time we realize that. You didn't know anything the day you were born. You have been brought up in this world learning the ways of the world, not the ways of God. You've got to unlearn the ways of the world and begin to learn the ways of God if you're ever going to know them and walk in them. Now, I must hurry. I want to cover this ground this time. So, he said, I am the eternal, your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments and do them, and hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, and you shall know that I am the eternal, your God. Notwithstanding the children rebelled against me, they walked not in my statutes, neither kept my judgments to do them, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. They polluted my Sabbaths. Then I said, I'd pour out my fury upon them to accomplish mine anger against them in the wilderness. 
And verse 23, I lifted up mine hand unto them also in the wilderness, that I would scatter them among the heathen, and disperse them through the countries. Why? Here they were driven out in 2,520 years of slavery, as God had said back there in Leviticus 26. Now, why? Because they had not executed my judgments, but had despised my statutes, and had polluted my Sabbaths, had polluted God's Sabbaths. And their eyes were after their fathers' idols. Idolatry and Sabbath-breaking, the two great sins of Israel. That's why they've been driven out, my friends, into slavery and captivity for 2,520 years. Now, what about Judah, the Jewish people? All right, Jeremiah 17 gives that. Now, here it is, the very last verse, the 27th verse, Jeremiah 17. And here was what Jeremiah was inspired to say. Well, in the 21st verse, Thus saith the Eternal, Take heed to yourselves, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day to bring it in the gates of Jerusalem, neither carry forth a burden out of the houses on the Sabbath day, neither do you any work, but hallow you the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction." Are you willing to receive instruction? Listen, my friends, all your life you've been receiving the instruction of this world, and maybe of some of this world's religions, and not the religion of God in your Bible. And if you haven't heard it before, it's because you've been brought up in this world. You've been reared in it, the world that does not know the ways of God, that has departed from the ways of God. Your Bible says, prove all things. You think you've proved it? No, you haven't. You haven't really proved these things, because your Bible says things you don't believe it says. And you believe things that the Bible doesn't say, but just exactly the opposite. You know, I know you don't hear this kind of preaching, do you? Well, this is going to stir you up and make you think a little bit. But I still say, don't believe me. I'm not going to mislead you. I'm just trying to get you to look into your Bible. Well, here are the ways of God, and it's in your Bible. Open your Bible and read it with your own eyes. Now, verse 27. But if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, says God, and not to bear a burden, even entering into the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire at the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. And you turn over to the very last chapter in Jeremiah, the very last chapter now in the book of Jeremiah, and you will find where that absolutely happened. Here it is, the uh, 52nd chapter of Jeremiah. And the 13th verse, where Nebuchadnezzar, the general of the army of King Nebuchadnezzar, entered into Jerusalem, and verse 13, he burned the house of the Eternal and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem, and all the houses of the great men burned he with fire. Now, my friends, let's get back to this and see. Here in David's day, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, the same way they did in the temptation in the wilderness. Your fathers have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Now that's quoted from David in the Psalms, 95, verses 7 to 11. But now Paul, speaking to us in this time now, and that's for us in this 20th century, because all those things were written for our learning and our admonition. And here it is now in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Take heed, brethren, that's brethren in Christ in this day of grace, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. That's the way they departed, and that is given as an example for you and for me. So, while it is said today, in this day of the 20th century, this most crucial day, this most terrifying day of all the history of this world, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. I've shown you how they did it. God says for us not to do it as they did it. Now then, chapter 4. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. And the rest promised us now is the rest of of the very kingdom of God. A spiritual rest when this mortal shall become immortal. This human shall actually be made divine by a resurrection from the dead or by an instantaneous changing from mortal to immortal. So, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, in them that heard it. 
because of their disobedience. And I've just shown you what that disobedience was. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day in this wise. Now, how did they disobey? How did they depart from the ways of God? By breaking the Sabbath and by idolatry. Now, here he spake in this certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest on the seventh day from all his works. He showed them which day was the seventh day by the raining of manna from heaven. He drove them out and punished them 2,520 years, and the Jewish people are still under that divine punishment because of Sabbath breaking, my friends. And then in this place, if they shall enter into my rest. Now that is the Greek word kataposin, which means spiritual rest. Seeing, therefore, it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, in the Psalms again now, Today, after so long a time, it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. If they had had rest, then there wouldn't have to be another day of today now for us to get salvation. There remaineth, therefore, a rest, and here the word is sabbatismus, not the Greek word kataposin, but the Greek word sabbatismus, which means the literal keeping of a seventh-day Sabbath unto the people of God. There it is, Hebrews 4, verse 9, and that's for us today. Which day is the Christian Sabbath? Why, that's easy, most people would say. It's Sunday, of course. But is it really? And does it even make any difference which day, if any, a person keeps? If man established the Sabbath, it doesn't. If God did, that's a different story. You would think God would make it absolutely clear which day to keep and how to keep it, wouldn't you? You would think God would put the answer right in your Bible. And you'd be right. That's exactly where it is. The free booklet, Which Day is the Christian Sabbath, reveals from the Bible which day God set apart as the Sabbath. Now you can be sure which day is the Christian Sabbath. You have heard The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong, sponsored by the Worldwide Church of God. For the free literature offered on this program... Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.